He has worked as a business journalist and as chief editor for business at Afton Boston. All right. Okay. And he's also been a stockbroker. He lives in Oslo with his wife, Kristin, who is here. Hello, Kristin. And he's published several works of fiction and nonfiction, and uh, he's written this fantastic book called Everest, The Death Zone, that I read in fewer than three sittings, two sittings. I mean, it is, it is an amazing book. Uh, he will be signing copies of the book after this. So you guys should go grab yourself some copies. And uh, my second guest here today is Hugh Thompson. Hello, Hugh. Hugh read English at Cambridge and has written six books, two of which are available today. Are your other books available besides these? Or? No. I think mainly those two. Oh, mainly those two. Okay, so this one's about the Nanda Devi, and he's going to talk about this in detail later. And then there's this book, which is for people who are not that adventurous. It's called The Great Green Road into the Trees. And this book won the Wainwright Prize yes. for travel writing. Yes. Lovely. Thank you, guys. And uh, so what we'll do today is uh, Hugh will first go on stage and talk about his adventures, about climbing, after which Ord will follow him there. And then I'll ask them a few questions. And then we will open the floor for questions. Okay. Great. Well, it's great to be here today, and I'm really launching the Indian edition of this book here today. Uh, for reasons I'm going to go into, it was actually published a few years ago in England, and we couldn't publish it in India for legal and political reasons until now. So it's a great pleasure to be able to bring it to Jaipur and uh, talk about it. Um, there's a connection with William Dalrymple, who's so connected with Jaipur, in that the first time I heard about this mountain, uh, Nanda Devi, was when I was making some films with William in the Himalaya. And he told me about this area which was completely closed off, no one could go to for all sorts of reasons. And of course, that immediately made me want to go there. Uh, as, uh, as anything forbidden always does. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, expedition I joined, the last expedition that was allowed to go into Nandadevi, the expedition I joined to go there in the year 2000. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the reasons why the book couldn't be published in India until now. Um, so if we can begin, uh, the next slide please. Um, Nanda Devi. Now, Nanda Devi is a place of myth in some ways, and it's only created its own myth, partly because it is very remote, the sanctuary area around it, um, and as we'll see, uh, this is a, a map just showing where it is um, on the borders between India and uh, Tibet, um, uh, one, uh, one of the headwaters of the Ganges. But this map, or rather this drawing, shows why Nanda Devi has had such a mesmeric fascination for generations um, of climbers and indeed Indians. Because the problem about Nanda Devi, the mountain, it's the highest in India, um, uh, if we discount Sikkim, uh, and therefore very famous for that reason. But it is surrounded by a ring of other mountains. It's like a castle that has a moat around it. And it was very frustrating for the climbers of the um, late uh, 19th century, uh, early 20th century, like uh, this man. Uh, the great climbers of that era couldn't get to the bottom of Nanda Devi to even begin climbing it, because they couldn't get past all the mountains that ringed it. So it was like this sanctuary area, and that's how that area is always known, the Nanda Deva Sanctuary. No one could get into the sanctuary until these two men, Eric Shipton and Bill Tillman, legendary climbers of the 1920s and 1930s, 
decided to do it in a different way, to go there with just a few uh, friends and people, uh, uh, friendly Sherpas, and get into this interior sanctuary area, his Sh Shipton getting inside there, and they could, um, they could get to the sanctuary and report back on a place that up till then, mountaineers had said was as inaccessible as the North Pole. It was one of the great achievements of uh, British mountaineering uh, in the pre-war era. And later, other expeditions went there. And then, as I say, for reasons we're going to discuss, the whole area was closed by the Indian government in the 1970s. It became a legendary place for mountaineers and trekkers, a place everyone wanted to go to, but nobody could. Until the year 2000, when the IMF secured permission for one expedition only to be able to go back to uh, the sanctuary area. Um, and there is uh, the mountain glistening at the end of the valley, enticing the way we first saw it. Um, the reason that the expedition was able to take place was largely because of some of the people who were going. We had John Shipton, who was the son of Eric Shipton, the man who'd first been there. We had the legendary Indian uh, mountaineer, Norinda Bull Kumar, who I'm going to talk about later, uh, one of the finest of Indian mountaineers. And we had one of the people who'd been on the British Everest expedition um, in 1952. So it was kind of a stellar cast. And then, right at the end of that stellar cast, was the mountaineering groupie, um, they allowed me to come along as well. Uh, and I was very much there as the writer. I'm not, unlike Odd, a great mountaineer and climber. Odd's the one who's going to take you into the death zone. I'm one who usually potters around in the foothills uh, in a very enjoyable way. But I really wanted to join this expedition. Of course, I was a little nervous uh, about my lack of huge mountaineering credentials for this. So I said to the uh, British organizer, um, I said, well, look, you know, I haven't done a huge amount of mountaineering. I like mountains. I've led expeditions trekking, but I'm not a great tooth and nail climber. And he said in a very British way, he said, don't worry, Hugh, you'll be fine as long as you've got a good head for heights. And that was a phrase I was to remember uh, with some bitterness much later as my head for heights was, was tested. Um, there's a nice story, by the way, about Eric Shipton and Bill Tillman, the first climbers who came to the area, just to show the British style, which was they went for six months. They lived in a tent together, just a few Sherpas to help them. And then after four months, Tillman turned to Shipton and he said, no, sorry, Shipton turned to Tillman and said, I say, do you think we should start calling each other by our Christian names? <laughs> and Tillman, who was the tougher one, looked at him and said, well, we could, but wouldn't it just sound so damn silly. So that was the English style. Slightly changed since then. Everyone's a bit more relaxed. Um, it's a lovely part of the world. Uh, can I just see a show of hands? Who's been up to that area of the upper Ganges towards Gangotri, Joshimaf? Good. None of you are allowed to ask me questions afterwards because you'll know too much, but good to hear that there are some people who've, who've been there already. Um, but it is a lovely part of the world, a very spiritual part of the world, and that's partly what drew me there, was the sense of all those people who are making pilgrimages up uh, into the mountains and who we saw as we, we walked. Um, I loved that feeling that we were part of a stream of humanity at the beginning of the walk, traveling up um, into this very religious and spiritual area, uh, the, the, the Vaishnamite, the Shaivite, Sadhus all congregating there, many Nagasadhus, many of the festivals there. I really enjoyed that whole spiritual aspect uh, as we went to a mountain, which of course has a very spiritual di dimension as well. Um, a place where Shiva once resided in the Himalayas. There was a wonderful rainbow over the Ganges as I walked up it. All these photographs are mine uh, that I'm showing you. A wonderful rainbow as a symbol of good luck as we began this journey. Um, and here is Norinda Bull Kumar, a legendary uh, Indian mountaineer who had climbed um, Nanda Devi before. 
He had climbed Trishul before, and of course he had climbed Everest before. A great man, and at one point he turned to me and he said, Hugh, the Indian Army has given me so many medals for mountaineering, I have no space left on my chest. <laughs> a good determined man and a great person to be with. And of course he told me many wonderful stories about Indian mountaineering. Often some of those early trips in the 60s and the 70s, they didn't have the resources, they couldn't be given even proper boots to climb. So when he climbed Trishul, for instance, Bull suffered terrible frostbite, as did many of his men, because that was an era when the Indian teams weren't as well equipped as they should have been. Next picture. Here is John Shipton, uh, Eric Shipton's son, a wonderful plants man, a wonderful person to travel with as well, full of stories about his father, great knowledge about the botany of the area we were traveling through, which was very, very beautiful. This is looking back down towards the Ganges, towards the little village of Lata Karak, which is the last village we stayed in. Very friendly place, the people there, very excited that we were going into the sanctuary area, uh, which is uh, closed off now for military reasons. So they were very envious that we could go there, and those porters who could accompany us were very happy to be going with us. A boy writing his name on his hand so I wouldn't forget him uh, just as we left the village. And then, rather more extraordinarily, just as we were leaving, rather like Coleridge's ancient mariner, a man stopped us as we were leaving, the oldest man in the village, and said that as a small boy, he could remember Eric Shipton and Bill Tillman leaving on their expedition. And while we were digesting this extraordinary chronological link, he then said, again, rather like the ancient mariner, he said that he had seen many expeditions leave Fernanda Devi and the sanctuary area, and several times he'd seen people who had not come back. And that is, of course, one of the great things about Nanda Devi, is that over the years it has claimed, very sadly, many fatalities. And we'll talk a bit about that later. Next picture. But on into this beautiful area of the Nanda Devi sanctuary, which, because it's closed off for military reasons, uh, is, has remained very, very beautiful. The ecology is wonderful. Very beautiful forests as we were climbing up. Here is George Band. George Band, when this photo was taken, um, was an old man. But as a young man in 1952, he was the youngest member of the British expedition to climb Everest. So an extraordinary person for me to be sharing a tent with. And I listened to his stories about that Everest climb. I learned so much on this whole journey with people like George. Um, who was still very strong, so a very good climber. One of the nice things about mountains is you stay good at climbing uh, even as you get uh, older. You keep your mountain legs. Um, but here we are. You can see our camp in the bottom right there, climbing high up into the sanctuary area, a cairn marking the beginning of the forbidden zone beyond which we weren't supposed uh, to pass without permission. Of course, we did have permission, so we could getting higher up towards Trishul, one of the great mountains of this area. And Bull Kumar told me with some pride, he said, Hugh, not only did I climb Trishul, I skied down it. Next picture. Uh, Lama Gaia flying high above us. Wonderful light, wonderful mountains. And here, in the distance, one of the most famous and elusive of all Himalayan peaks, Changabang, the shining mountain which Chris Bonington left a wonderful account of climbing, an extraordinary pinnacle peak that uh, few have seen and even fewer have climbed. Uh, but onwards and high, and it took days, of course, to get up towards Nanda Devi, but we always had the image here of Nanda Devi itself, the peak in the distance, uh, luring us on. Um, and we were all getting very excited as we approached, getting to know each other much better, the Indian, the Boisha porters the, who were with us, um, relaxing here with, I think they're called some local herbal cigarettes, um, uh, uh, really enjoying the fact that they could get into the sanctuary area and see it with us uh, legally. I'm sure they'd sneaked in uh, for the odd visit themselves, but this was an official uh, visit. And of course, they wanted to get into the area. They gathered Angelica 
and juniper from the area when they could. Uh, this is uh, the lovely uh, Bishal, lovely uh, uh, boy who was helping me because I was, had so much camera equipment I needed someone just to help carry all the, the stuff I was taking all these pictures with. Oh dear, topless picture of me I'm afraid in younger days, shaving outside my tent. And then we began the climb up towards the sanctuary area. Um, coming up closer, the porters playing music for us, more herbal cigarettes, and all gathering around playing cards. I'm afraid most of their uh, earnings uh, from being a porters were traded and waged and gambled as we traveled. Um, but lovely scenes in these little forest glades of uh, the porters playing music. I always remember the music playing. One of the leaders of the expedition. And then we got to Ramani. Ramani is in the gorge at the bottom of the Ganges that leads up to the sanctuary area. And that's why it's so difficult to get to, because there's this deep box canyon gorge, which is very difficult uh, to, um, to get, to get to up to. And that's what took people like Shipton and Tillman, the early climbers, so long to work out how you could get up this gorge and into the sanctuary area. It's like a jigsaw. It took them months and months to work out how to do it. So in Ramani, we were quite nervous before we began the climb itself. I was very nervous. The porters were as well. You can see everyone looking tense and drawn. Um, the, short, the kids were left behind. Here's Bull Kumar giving all the climbers a bindi mark. It was a mixed expedition of British and Indian climbers in a very attractive way, a cooperative expedition. And then we began this climb. This is where my good head for heights began to be tested. Uh, climbing up and getting closer and closer to the sanctuary area and beginning to see it. And here we are almost there. Now this is called the Stairway to Heaven by the, uh, the porters. The reason they call it to the Stairway to Heaven is not after the, the, the Led Zeppelin song, but is because the porters said, look, it's a stairway to heaven because if you get up to the top, you reach the sanctuary area, and if you fall off, you'll probably go to heaven. And then we came inside the sanctuary area. We could see these lovely grasslands around the mountain. An amazing moment for everybody who'd never been here before. There we are walking across the stone slabs towards the bottom of the mountain. And we came to a little chapel, a very sad little chapel, which is a memorial to a young American climber, a girl who was called, rather extraordinary, she was actually called Nanda Devi herself, she was called Nanda Devi Unsold because her father, seen on the right, Willie Unsold, a great American climber, had always fantasized about Nanda Devi as the ultimate mountain in the Himalayas, the most elusive of all peaks. He named his daughter Nanda Devi, and when she was 19, she was a very good climber, he, sorry, 21, he brought her here to climb the mountain herself as a symbolic act with this uh, expedition shortly before it was closed by the Indian government, the area. And it was often called the tragic expedition because there were arguments among the team as they climbed. There was a lot of bad feeling and bad spirits. And when Nanda Devi climbed up high on the mountain, sorry, we stopped there for a moment. When Nanda Devi climbed up high on the mountain, uh, she suddenly got altitude sickness and she died from pulmonary edema at a very young age, tragic. And her father, Willie, who wrote the most heartbreaking book about this whole trip, described how he had to commit her body to the abyss, so to speak. They gave her a mountain burial, which is all they could do at the height they'd reached, and cast her body off from the buttress they'd reached just below the summit um, at a very, very tender age. Many others have, um, have died on, on Nanta Devi. And, um, you know, I say in the book, terrible thing to read from your own book, but I do say that one of the problems about um, Nanda Devi is that it reveals the tragic history of those who've tried to reach it, shows what happens when the dream of finding a sanctuary, one of mankind's oldest and most compulsive quests, collides with solid rock. And it has, like many other mountains claimed, far too many lives. A much higher proportion of people have died trying to reach Nanda Devi than have trying to reach Everest, for instance. 
I loved going there. It was an extraordinary moment to uh, reach that sanctuary area. Extraordinary, of course, because also you feel privileged because so a few other people can go there, which, of course, is a cue for what I'm going to talk about for the last couple of minutes that remain to me, which is why? Why can we not go there? I think it should be the birthright of every Indian to be able to go to the Nantadeva Sanctuary if they want to. It remains India's highest mountain. It remains one of India's most holy places. I find it remarkable that there's not more discussion of this issue. And the reason, which some of you may know already, but I'm going to give you more detail, and I revealed a lot of it in my book, is that in the 1960s, the CIA approached the Indian intelligence services with a remarkable proposition. And the proposition was this. This was not long after the Indochina War. They said, why not put a nuclear-powered spying device on the summit of Nanda Devi near Tibet, and you will be able to see if the Chinese are planning any rocket launches. A crazy idea, an idea that immediately should have been consigned to the dustbin of history. And of course, the Indian intelligence services said, yes, let's do it. So the CIA and the Indian intelligence services got together. They went out. They hired a crack team of Indian mountaineers and of American mountaineers. The American mountaineers were given man-tan, sun-tan lotion so that they could darken their skin to look as if they were Indian mountaineers. The whole operation is like something out of Austin Powers, actually, because they got together, they were trained for what was called Operation Blue Mountain. And in 1964, they set off with this nuclear-powered spying device carried by porters, no protection, of course, against the radioactive elements inside it, this team set off up to the Nantadevi Devi Sanctuary. They got halfway, and then, as Odd knows all too well, the problem about the Himalayas is either winter arrives or the monsoon arrives. Your window of climbing is very narrow and can change all the time. And in this came time, as they say in Game of Thrones, winter came too early. And they had to get out. But that was no problem. They said, fine we'll park our nuclear-powered spying device halfway up the mountain, and we'll come back next year, in 1965, and we'll finish the job. They came back next year in 1965. There'd been a landslide. The nuclear-powered spying device had disappeared close to the headwaters of the Ganges in what was a monumental cock-up. So, of course, what did the CIA and the Indian government do? cover-up, one of the biggest cover-ups of all time. They said, no one's going to talk about this. We're going to bury the subject as much as we've buried the nuclear-powered spying device. There's going to be a complete ban on any publication of anything to do with this, and we're just going to pretend it never happened. We're going to close off the whole area, and we're going to say it's for ecological reasons, which is an irony of sorts. Eco the ecological reason being that there was a radioactive device they had lost in the middle of the Nanta Devi Sanctuary. Now, no one talked about this for years, but then very slowly, of course, mountaineers being mountaineers, talked about this over campfires. The story started to come out, and I decided to publish this book and really go to town on it. And, uh, and uh, around the same time, other reports in magazines started to get published, and then there's been a little bit more about it in India since my book. But until this year, the full story hasn't been published. So I'm very proud to be able to publish it now that Hachette has taken the decision to publish it in India and tell the story and uh, give you a bit more chapter and verse in the, in, in the book itself. But I think it's an absolute disgrace that uh, the Indian government just doesn't come clean on this and say, look, we need to clear up this problem and make the area accessible again. It is literally a ticking time bomb. You know, it's a radioactive control device. And one of the reasons so many of these mountaineers have now started to talk about it, and the porters as well, is some of them have suffered leukemia and radioactive-related diseases. Of course, you carry a radioactive device, you know, up into the mountains as an expedition. Some of you are going to suffer as a result, which is what 
has happened. Captain Coley, a very distinguished Indian mountaineer who, um, who's written a book about this finally, he had to publish it in the States originally for the same reasons, um, uh, has been very angry about this, quite rightly, a very distinguished man, about how all this happened, how they were coerced to, into doing it by the Indian authorities, who sort of went, you know, if you want to do big climbs in the future, you better help us do this. Um, and I think it's one of the great stories and great disgraces and scandals of the Himalayas. And I hope this festival, as I come up to my 20 minute mark, I hope this festival will mark the beginning of a campaign to see the Indian government do a little bit more about it. But anyway, at that point, on my 20 minutes, thank you very much. And at the end, let's take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, I forgot to mention how amazing this book is. I was up until 4.30 this morning finishing it. <laughs> Please do buy it, do read it, get it signed. Uh, you'll thank me for it later. You can thank me for it later. Odd, why don't you take the yes. stage? Yeah. Am I on? No. Can you put me on? Yes. Hey. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. fine. Yeah, I agree. The book is fantastic. Thank um, you. And I also will support your course because, right, there is an unwritten novel about the CIA case. Uh, and it's high on my list, and I will probably do it with a local writer so I can, <laughs> it can be published in India. Um, I've climbed Mount Everest. I've skied to the North Pole. I've skied to the South Pole. When you look at me, you see an adventure. <laughs> when I look at myself, I see something else. Um, my parents were very young when they got me. They had to go off to work immediately, so I was raised by my grandmother for the first four or five years. Um, she's dead now, a long time, so I can say she was deeply psychotic. <laughs> um, and when I was four or five years old, I was fat, I could hardly walk, and she had made me afraid of absolutely everything. So, for the rest of my life, I have been running away from my grandmother. Um, I've never been able to get a real big distance. So, what has been with me all my time is my uh, being very afraid of heights. I tried to kill it by climbing Everest. I didn't really manage to kill it, but I managed Everest. Um, so, it shows it's possible. And all of you have a grandmother inside. <laughs> so um, I will take you to uh, um, um, Everest Climb, um, and then I'll speak a little bit of, about my novel afterwards. Uh, and I can say you will much prefer to do it in 20 minutes than in 60 days. Next. This is Everest seen from the north side. When the Britons came to Tibet in the early 20s, they saw it from this side and they said, this cannot be climbed. Um, they didn't believe it, of course, but they were true. it was true. No one managed to climb Everest from the north side until the 60s. They tried for 40 years. So it was only when Nepal were opened to foreigners uh, in 1951 and then they managed from the other side in just two years. So why did I decide to do it from the north side? I don't know. It must have been my grandmother. She never made it easy for me. Next. An Everest expedition is mostly, it's, a, it's physical, but it's also a mental game. It's a mind game. Um, it's such a lot of waiting, playing cards, eating tons of peanuts, um, having a headache, being sick. Um, it's all from the altitude. There is no quick way to any big mountain. Um, you, if, if you want to do um, Kilimanjaro, you need a week, because that's 6,000 meters. If you want to do Aconcagua, which is the highest outside Himalaya, you will need three weeks. If you do, want to do 8,000 meters, you need Six, thousand, six weeks. Everest, eight, nine weeks. Every meter is a new challenge. 
even if it's pretty flat. Next. From Basecamp, which was the previous um, picture, to advanced Basecamp, which is at, really at the foot of Everest, is 20 kilometers of gravel. Not challenging, but very tough going. You have to go up and down several times. And we are not yuck, uh, yucks. Um, but it's also a logistic operation. We had 125 yucks just to get our equipment from base camp to advanced base camp. And people say, oh, why all this equipment? We needed 65 tents. Though we were only five climbers and five shepherds. It's because of all the camps up the mountain. You don't want to, to take your, your tent, your equipment, your sleeping bag and everything up and down all the time. It doesn't work. Next. It's a beautiful landscape, but you really only care about your, back, your headache <laughs> um, and vomiting and stumbling up this gravel at least the first time. The second time, it goes better. And the third time, it's OK. But then, next, it gets, it's all the same every new level. Next. Sometimes we had a smile. Um, and um, it's probably the tea. And uh, maybe we had got a new supply of peanuts. Uh, it's really, you look upon uh, climbing Everest as dangerous. It is dangerous, but it's also boring. It's not as boring as going to the South Pole, um, which is 60 <laughs> days of flat ice, snow, nothing to see, nothing to do. Compared to that, this is a party. Next. Then the Sherpas, um, they are very, very, um, uh, they are obsessed with um, the gods, and so am I. I don't want to, 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 to uh, be without any god um, on, on Everest. So in base camp, we had a, um, a long ceremony blessing the, the participants uh, of, of the expedition. And then in advanced base camp, we had all the same, I think it was three hours, blessing of every item we had. The shoes, we had five minutes for the shoes, five minutes for the ice axe, and so on and so on. Um, but I, I didn't challenge that. Next. The Sherpas, they are the real heroes of Himalaya. Um, in the early years, um, when the Britons were re leading the climbs uh, in the Himalayas, they treated them as second class. Um, they would, but they would probably not have reached Everest. They would, the Britons would still be at the foot of Everest if they hadn't been for the Sherpas. Uh, OK. <laughs> yep. Maybe not. Um, today, um, there is a, uh, the tension between the climbers and the Sherpas have increased over the years. Um, they have uh, become more uh, self-assured. Um, they demand decent pay. Um, but they, they do the, the most dangerous jobs. Um, when, of all the deaths on, on, on Everest, which is now, I think, past 300, uh, half of them are, are Sherpas. Um, just two years ago, there was an avalanche on the other side. 18 people killed, all, all Sherpas. Um, next, please. So when you get to the foot of the mountain, you spend a lot of time studying it. Can I really do this? Next. And it, like the first you see is a wall up to 7,000 meters. Um, and you know you have to do it many times, just for the acclimatization. And not being a, a climber, I've been to many mountains, but I, I, I do not call myself a climber. And with my fear of heights, I was not looking forward to that uh, climb up there. And that, when you reach that call of 7,000 meters, you still have two kilometers up to go. Next. But when you're in there, when you're in, in the wall, um, it's so tough going. 
Uh, you have a heavy backpack because the, the, the Sherpas, they carry a lot, but you, you have to do a lot yourself. And every, you, you, the higher up you get, the slower it goes. Um, and you do one or two steps, and then you wait for one minute, and then you another two steps. Um, and you just go on and go on on your own, and then you're there. Next. This is one of the, this is, um, one of the high camps. Um, it's not easy to find places to put a tent on the north face of Everest. Next. Um, this is the highest camp in the world. Uh, it's 8,350 meters. Um, the view is fantastic. Um, the air is fantastic. It's just so little of it. And the, it's, it's, it's not the oxygen, it is the oxygen, but it's really the, 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 the air pressure that is different. So at 5,000 meters, you only have half the oxygen as, as we have here. Um, and at the summit of Everest, you only have one third of the oxygen. And when you pass 8,000 meters, you enter what the doctors call the death zone. Above that line, your body cannot survive anymore. Um, so your body is smart, smarter than you. Uh, it starts shutting off functions. And sooner or later, it has shut off everything. So you just need to get up there and down again before everything is shut down. And one of the first things that the body finds out it has to shut down is your brain. Because you, you don't really need your brain to, to survive. Um, and that is why people do so many uh, stupid things, uh, like continuing when they should turn around, like uh, doing it, some, some try to do it without oxygen. Very stupid, very dangerous, and especially dangerous for those people who try to rescue them. Um, we had oxygen from 7,500. Next. Um, we can do another one because there's a, next please. Um, so um, oxygen is not a, it's not a miracle. Uh, it, it just helps a little, but that little is very vital. Um, so, but every oxygen can weighs four kilos. If you have two in your backpack and some other gear uh, and, and the backpack itself, it's 15 kilos on your back. Uh, I mean, it's really steep. Um, you, you really feel that. But then, as I said, when you have passed 8,000 meters, the clock is ticking. Um, every hour counts. And the oxygen, you can turn from one to four. If you have it on four, it's very pleasant, but you run out of it very quickly. So you have to measure, have it on one or two, and then count the hours. Can I make it to the top? And not least, can I make it back? Next. When you're at high camp at 8,350, you start for the summit um, at midnight. And it's completely dark. You, you're looking like the Michelin man. Um, and you have huge boots, backpack, uh, goggles, um, a, a mask. Um, a headlamp, which means that every time you turn to talk to someone, they look at you and you, you can see who it is. Um, there is no way to have any communication. Um, it's, uh, there is no way to pass each other. It's just this very thin, thin edge, uh, and there's 3,000 meters down on three sides. Um, and for me, as I told you, not the ideal of place. Next. So there you go in the night. It goes even slower. We are down to like one step and two minutes break. Next, please. This is a, in a, a famous uh, point at, uh, and very close to the summit. Uh, under his, uh, one of the Sherpas, under his feet, there are 3,000 meters straight down. So, 
and you have to go around this rock, and it's almost impossible to find. You can't find any footing, so you just have to, like, yeah, you find some footing because people get around there. <laughs> um, and next, please. I have chosen this picture because it's the most famous Everest picture. It is um, Tenzing Norgay, the first on Everest, along with Hillary. And those two reached uh, summit of Everest in 53. Um, and all journalists, everyone in the world, they were obsessed with who were the first. Some of the, one of you had to be the first, but they refused to say. They never gave it away. And uh, the re one of the reasons why this is very important and, and historic picture is not only because um, it's Tenzig on the picture. There is no picture of Hillary on the summit because Tenzig had never seen a f uh, he couldn't take photos. He had never seen it before. <laughs> so, uh, and he couldn't start educating him at 8,850 meters. <laughs> so, Hillary had, <laughs> he has been there, but there is no evidence. Next. When you're on the summit of Everest, you're halfway because you have to go down again. And the most dangerous on Everest is going down. Most people die on the way down. Um, because when you fall on the way up, you fall into the mountain. If you fall on the way down, you fall out of the mountain. And it's also on the way down that you run out of oxygen. And the clock is ticking, 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 ticking. And deaths on Everest, they are very unspectacular. People sit down to take a rest, and they never race again. And no one is coming to, to get them. So they sit there or lie there. Um, just below the summit, there is a, a, a small gorge, which is filled with five, six climbers, or maybe more. I couldn't take a picture because it was dark, but you could, you could see an arm and a leg, um, and you didn't want to, to stay there. But it's the only, there is no way anyone can get up there and get the bodies down. Next, please. Um, I'm not too proud that I took that photo, but I needed it. Um, this is outside my tent when I came down to the high camp. There was a Japanese dead. Um, it felt unreal. Um, but on that night, four people died. Two fell, two Koreans fell. Um, I don't know, I, the Japanese, um, there was no one to ask, so I don't know. He, he um, probably had the, 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 the altitude sickness. Um, the day before, on the way up, uh, I went into what I thought was my tent. There was a man there. Uh, it later turned out uh, we, he would never walk out again because he was dead. Um, so that was four deaths in one day. Um, it feels unreal. But I will keep that photo there to remind you uh, how dangerous it is. In my book, Everest the Death Zone, um, it's not an adventure book, it's a novel. I try to put uh, into context um, what happens on Everest today. There are lots of uh, commercial expeditions. In this book, there are four people signing up and paying a fortune to be with Sir Richard, a uh, climbing legend. They ha all have this ambition to climb Everest, but uh, they have different motivations. Uh, some of them are running away from something, maybe their grandmother. Someone is running towards something, a dream. And as the tension increases, because there's such a lot of waiting, um, and uh, they have to cooperate, but it gets more and more difficult to cooperate because of the tension, the difficulties between them. They start hating each other. Um, so when you combine this inner tension with a suspense 
of the mountain itself, um, it gets really, really um, difficult, dangerous, and um, I think it's very realistic. And it's n I'm not giving anything away when I say that um, they don't wall return, which is also very realistic. And then my 20 minutes. <laughs> you have one or two more minutes. No, I don't need it. Mm. Yeah. No, 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 no. Carry on. This is excellent. Um, questions, please. <laughs> up, up. Or can I ask you the first question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason you chose to write a work of fiction instead of, say, a non-fiction book? I have written adventure books before. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, to write a novel is much, much more challenging, mm -hmm. much more rewarding. Um, the characters, they say exactly what they wanted to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In real life, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the right people die mm -hmm. in the novel. <laughs> in real life, it's the wrong people who die. <laughs> so I will stay with fiction from here. Okay, fantastic. Excellent. Uh, my uh, next question is for you, Hugh. Um, uh, you told me you used to be a trekker before uh, you, you uh, ascended Nanda Devi. Mm. What kind of training did you have to go through? I mean, what kind of uh, a regimen and how long did it go on? Okay, for? so I've done lots of stuff at altitude, particularly in the Peruvian Andes. I've led a lot of expeditions to the Peruvian Andes and many of my books are about the Incas and looking for Inca ruins. And I've realized over the years that the thing about altitude is the people who get ill at altitude are the people who are really fit. Because if you're really fit at ground level, you need all the oxygen there is. So as soon as you get high, you notice when it's no longer there. So I've decided over many years to be very disciplined and to be extremely unfit. Uh, and, and therefore, when I go to altitude, I won't notice the lack of oxygen. And of course, this has taken a great deal of mental discipline but I always try to, you know, drink a bit and go to a few parties and generally be uh, not too fit, which is hard, but uh, I've managed. And that therefore, when I go to altitude for something like Nanta Devi, I won't notice the, uh, the lack of oxygen. Oh, wow. I have to add, I go to more parties than you. <laughs> <laughs> You're Norwegian. <laughs> um, I mean, for uh, aspiring mountaineers in the audience, uh, do you have any advice, or uh, Stay at home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> more, but more, more general advice for the young ones here. Um, in, general advice in life. Never do as your mother says. <laughs> or grandma. Oh, yeah. Because then grandma. you will, uh, she wants you at home. Um, <laughs> And she doesn't want you to be as exposed to anything. But then you have to remember the second rule. Mm -hmm. Always make your mother proud. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever you are thinking of, should I do this or should I do that? Just think, would my mother be proud of this? And if the answer is no, don't do it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. There are volunteers around the room with mics. Do ask your questions. Uh, there's someone right here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello. My question is for you. You can you stand repeating. up, please? Just so everyone can hear you. Yeah. All right. And see you. Yeah. OK. My question is for you. You kept repeating that uh, Nanda Devi is the highest mountain in India. Can you hear We can't this? hear you. No? All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, you kept repeating here that uh, Nanda Devi is the highest mountain in India, but uh, it is Kanchenjunga, isn't it? A absolutely, thank you. So the question for everyone, I, uh, just so I'll repeat it again, was I was saying Nanda Devi is the highest mountain in India. The first time I said that, I did make a careful, careful distinction about Sikkim and outside Sikkim and Kanchenjunga. And of course, at the time when Nanda Devi was first climbed, Sikkim was not part of India. So it's a, it's a little bit of a finesse. I should say as well, though, it's a very good question because it reminds me that one of the reasons the British mountaineers were obsessed with climbing Nanda Devi at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, is that made it also de facto the then highest mountain in the British Empire. So you may say for bad imperial reasons, that meant that it became even more of a goal 
for those British mountaineers, and the fact that they failed to climb it was even more of a frustration. Uh, the lady in the back there? Yeah. This is a question to Odd. You've given us excellent advice. Uh, well, you've given excellent advice to young climbers. Can you also give advice to mothers of young <laughs> climbers? Yes. Um, re remind them of the second rule. Always make your mother proud. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a question right there. Yeah. Uh, for many of us, you know, it's the movie Everest released recently that, sorry, um, released recently that tells us a little bit about this. How realistic is that movie without breaching any copyright uh, type things? Um, that movie is based on uh, real events taking place in 96. Um, so it's um, the, the, the highlight of the, of the movie uh, where um, the guy is talking to his wife through the radio, you can hear it live on YouTube. So this exists. Uh, of course, uh, a Hollywood movie will always have to make some, bend some rules and shorten it, and people have the, the good ones are better, than, and then in real life, and the, the bad ones are even worse. Um, but it's a very realistic film. I would say it to 95%. Uh, the gentleman here has a question. Uh, do you think the Sherpas were treated properly in the movie? Do they get the right sort of press or not? Um, remember, this is 22 years ago. Um, and the status of the Sherpas have increased gradually. But it's still not there that um, they treat it equally with, from all expeditions. There are some, there are probably not any Russians here. <laughs> if there are any Russians here, raise your hand and I shut my mouth. No. Okay. The Russians are the, the worst. Um, they treat people like animals. And there are other nations. Um, um, while I would say that many Western nations are treating them almost as they deserve, but only almost. Um, so uh, there is still a way to go. But I also have to add that the Sherpas have become an upper class in Tibet. Uh, because they make quite a lot of money out of their expeditions. And um, they invest in hotels and travel industry. And as a group, um, they're doing quite well. I just have one other question then. How come the, the Sherpas go on the north side, but the Tibetans do not assist? Uh, uh, they're perfectly, the Tibetans are perfectly capable of assisting in altitude, but they bring in Sherpas to climb the north face. Yeah, but they, they know the Sherpas are, are just as um, prominent both on the north side and the south side. Uh, uh, there are, uh, in Tibet, you don't find uh, good climbers, I think. Um, I also have to say that the, some of the Sherpas, um, they are also businessmen. So they treat, they hire porters from the lowlands. They don't give them a, a decent equipment. So you have the same layer. Uh, that they don't treat their porters very well. Um, I guess that's the world, but we, should do, we, we are trying to do something about it. Thank you. The gentleman in the pink shirt, yeah. Uh, you, my, question is that, uh, my question is that you said that 8,000 plus is a dead zone. Correct, but why Eight. climbers revisit it? You mentioned that 8,000 plus Could meter is a dead zone. 8,000 is a? 8,000 meter. 8,000 plus meter yeah. is a dead zone that you mentioned. Yes, yes, yes. So why climbers revisit it? So why climbers? Revisit it. Ha. Yeah. Why, uh, why yes, revisit yeah, it? I, I got the question. Um, the, it's very difficult to answer why people climb mountains. Uh, in 1923, um, the leg climbing legendary Mallory, who disappeared on Everest and who may have been the first on Everest because no one knows. He was only found in 19, his body was found in 99 uh, at 8,100. He gave an answer because he, he, he got the same question as you are putting out now. And he said to the journalist, because it's there. 
Uh, it's a stupid answer, but it also tells it all. Um, man will continue to climb mountains because they are there. Um, and the, the attraction of, of Everest has only grown. Um, uh, and I think it will continue. Even though you had the earthquake, you had the big avalanches. So for two years, there were no one on Everest uh, in 14 and 15. But the attraction will be there forever, no matter how dangerous. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you to you both. Thank you to you both for this lovely presentation. Could you speak up? My Thank question you. is that the inevitable fallout of any expedition, not just yours, is the trashing of the Himalayas, the trash left behind by the expeditions. I just wanted your views on how possible or how impossible it is to address this problem. Because we read a lot about it. We have seen uh, documentaries giving us sure. visuals. Hugh, do and you we want also to take know it? that it is quite impossible, but I'm sure there must be a ray of possibility also. So your views yeah. on this. A, a very, very interesting question, but I totally disagree. Um, I had heard about all the litter on Everest. And I was always, always wondering, why are people carrying so much litter um, towards the summit? Um, and this, this is just propaganda, especially from the Chinese. They have expeditions to clean the mountain. There is no, nothing to clean. Um, the only thing that is left on the mountain every year is a new rope. So the only thing you have to remember when you climb that this year's rope is green. And if you forget to take the red one, you're in danger. <laughs> uh, so, and it's just because you don't carry anything that you don't need. Uh, the, the oxygen tanks, they are so valuable. Uh, so the, the Sherpas always take them down. So it's very, very little. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think this is like a, a bit of propaganda. And can I, can I perhaps just add as well that, I mean, one of the nice things about the Nanda Devi Sanctuary I went to was, of course, it's an area where no mountaineer expeditions are able to go for reasons I described. So it was very nice seeing that as a contrast, an area which was completely unspoilt and a, a, a wonderful ecological zone and completely pristine, and indeed, as you say, the way the, the, the Himalaya should be. We may have time for one last question. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yes, sir. Yeah. The authors will be signing copies of their books, so you're more than welcome to ask your questions to them then. Uh. All, all rationalism says that you can't climb Everest without uh, oxygen. But many people have submitted the Everest without oxygen. So what was the trick behind it, or what was the method? It's absolutely possible to climb uh, Everest without oxygen, but to me it's meaningless. Uh, because mountaineering is about reducing risk, not increasing it. Um, so you increase the risk of yourself dying, and you increase the risk of those who have to rescue you when you're, uh, you have fainted, um, and you're helpless high up the mountain. So for me, it's just a very, very selfish uh, way of, uh, of climbing, and it's also totally against uh, the basic rules of mountaineering, but that will not stop people from continuing to do it. And it's the difference between using oxygen and not using, it's not big, but it's just big enough at that altitude. Thank you, thank you. Odd, Harold Haig, and Hugh Thompson. Thank you. And ladies thanks and to all of you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, both the writers will be signing copies of the books uh, on a desk, right? Where, where is the desk, volunteers? Okay, right there. Okay, so do follow us there if you want to. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's great. Thank you for making my job so We much wish to thank Hugh Thompson, <laughs> Odd, Harold. <laughs> 